I just told you we have time for this one. But it has, you have to lay down the ethical frameworks of the Thank you. Okay, for all the hardcore guys that are still here, you can ask questions. Alright? These guys are still breathing, still here. And. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I don't think. Oh. You need a microphone? No, 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 no. Uh, hi, aloha, mahalo, Mimi Sharma, uh, Teaching Asian Studies. Uh, my question is actually we're not officially up there, but it's. It's for our highest university representative, Chancellor Apple. Leading uh, off the purpose of the panel is what the university can do for the community, ethics for the university, and also the whole issue of land, seed, and water. So the question is, as a long time committed big troublemaker who's on this campus, I'd like to know how does all of this mesh with the university taking money from Monsanto uh, and... Good question. Thank you. Among other places that, that I won't mention. Well, um, again, I'm not an expert on uh, anything to do with agriculture. I'm a physical scientist and for many years uh, took funding from the federal government to do research uh, to try to better understand uh, where we're going. I don't know the, the micros of what Monsanto is doing and what they're funding. I do know that we have an awful lot of very ethical researchers who are trying to feed a world population of 7 billion. And I think you know, this is one of those cases where we have competing interests. Uh, how do we feed? Uh, there, there are you know, billion, a billion starving people in the world. I made that number up, but I know it's a lot of people starving. And the question is, as we continue to populate a fixed land, how do we feed all the people? And how do we feed them in the presence of all the things that all the crops? I'm not an expert in that, but what I'm glad is that people are doing research on that. And that's one of the missions of the university. I wonder if anybody in the panel would also like to respond. Technology development is always a controversial issue. Uh, kitchen knives are wonderful implements, but also dangerous weapons. And almost anything that we do in terms of research can be used for ill purpose. Uh, does that mean we shouldn't engage in that research? Uh, I, I would say that also that Many of the faculty that are engaged in research that's funded by corporations and so forth have, have the highest aspirations and integrity. They have their motivations for doing it, the end point of the research, which usually involves the education of graduate students and so forth. So there are many good things that come out of it. I think the key thing is that universities are not at least our organization is not involved in advocacy. Uh, we try to bring the best possible information to the table so that people who are in advocacy can make the best possible decisions. So I, I think that perhaps uh, one can't generalize that any research that's funded by a corporation is automatically bad. Any research that's funded by the federal government is automatically good or bad. I think one has to look at the specific issues and what is the outcome of it. That's one of the underlying issues that brought us where we are today. That's the reason why we got involved with the university was because of those issues. We were very nervous that large amounts of money were coming in to CTAR, and we were very nervous that the head of CTAR had a really um, strong biotech uh, background. So we were seeing writings on the wall, whether the writings were true or not true, made us really, really nervous about where the institution was going. 
So that's why we began trying to come over here and study the dialogue to figure out, you know, what does all of this mean? Because this is happening in our government. You know, money is also going into our government, but we couldn't even get a hearing on this issue because people were about half a million dollars worth of money going to our government. So as community members, we were very, very concerned. So how that plays out, time is going to tell. Is that it? Yeah, I, I just want to say a little bit, it's not just corporations. Whether engaging with government, other entities or corporations, you need a clearly enunciated ethical framework that you can be held accountable to. That's necessary. The engagement that will take place in community is going to take place. What is that framework, a, a transparency to that framework that you can decide whether this is a good thing or a bad thing? By the way, there have been historically many disinvestment movements also, which campuses have played a major role in, as you know. I think that engagement is one thing. It's quite another when a university becomes, as several universities I know have, a conveyor belt or a market research arm of the corporate world or a penetration agency, then you run into serious problems. So, if you have the clear framework, it's up there in the open, in a right information framework, then it can be challenged at any point if it is not clear for us. <coughs> That's a starting point, not the end. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a representative of the community because I'm not of the university folks here. And, and, you know, I grew up with the naive notion that somehow in a democracy the people were the government, and I remember that didn't work when I was about 17. But, the, but she brought up a question that it kind of hits my mind, is if we're trying community outreach, in my experience, this is a human being, I find that in general corporations are, you know, hostile, the antithesis of the community. They're not supporting, they're not, they're about making money for their stockholders, they're not about making my life better, creating food for my children and grandchildren that's healthy and nutritious. They're about selling me things loaded with fat and, and salt and addictive substances and McDonald's and brainwashing my kids and my grandkids. This is what they should be eating. So I'm kind of confused. If, if the university is so funded by these corporate interests, where does the community come from? Just curious if I could throw that out there. Good question. I, I, would, uh, I would like to uh, more or less paraphrase what Simon just said, is that you can, have, you can have ethical people and unethical people, and you can have ethical corporations and unethical corporations. That's not what he said. And, uh, uh, I grew up in a, in a, in a, a town that was, was virtually founded on a, on a corporation, Bethlehem Steel, and uh, virtually all of my friends and, and their families uh, lived and had a, a pretty good life, a comfortable life, by making steel. And the uh, company was owned by people, uh, and it benefited people. Well, I think it's different when the people own and run the company. I actually lived in Allentown for a while. Okay, but you know. <laughs> and, you know but but I think there's a difference yeah. when you have like strong active labor unions, or you have people making these decisions, not corporate overseers making it. When it's not the bottom line profit, when we're actually concerned with the people in the community. And I do feel that there's, and I'm like, I'm fairly well educated, I'm fairly in touch, but I don't feel a real connection to the university home. You do a better job connecting with the community in, the, in much like the old days of the job agriculture. And yeah, I love that, I love that, sir, because I don't feel that there is that connection. Well, I, I, uh, I think you're not alone, but I do know that, and then I see all the great things that many of our faculty are doing, we have to, we have to make them more visible and more visible. Hi, I'm Hector Valdez, I'm from the College of Agriculture. Uh, I should say that in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the University of Hawaii was recognized as a global center of, of agriculture. And part of the criticism is that we have drifted our research towards the lab, and that we have tried to become a, a, a center of biotechnology, and that it, from that perspective, it would be difficult to compete with the big ones like Stanford, the Berkeley, and even Singapore. 
uh, while we have left behind a lot of work that we just do at the farm level. Uh, but my question to the SIGNAF would be if you could comment a little further on the privatization of the university from the neoliberal perspective, because a lot of us in the US are not familiar with the neoliberal. And thank you. Okay. Um, it's been underway in a massive way in India, the privatization process. And well, uh, every shark in the education sweatshop business opened up a university and got it recognition through political influence. This would be called the deemed university. Okay. So I just opened something. I, the minister is my friend. I get a recognition. I run it with the faculty who have officially paid the university grants commission rates, but actually, and sign pay slips on that amount, but get a fraction of that amount. This, this went to such a situation that in the state of Chhattisgarh, now in India we have more, something more like this, British system. We have a university and colleges affiliated to the university. Okay. Now, here's the, so the colleges are many, the universities are many. Here's the fun. This kind of racketeering in the private education sector that was set off with the privatization led to a situation in the state of, in the state of Chhattisgarh in India. The number of deep universities was larger by several times than the number of colleges. <laughs> okay. There are more universities than colleges in Chhattisgarh. Then in my home state of Pradesh, every other member of the legislative assembly set up a college. <laughs> now, here's what happens. Suddenly there's an excess capacity of 13,000 seats in engineering in America. So then the government declares in the name of the poor, always in the name of the poor, because these colleges, I mean these colleges are owned by multi-millionaires. You have to understand, for this a small digression, you have to understand Indian wealth, not Indian poverty. The difference between a multi-millionaire in North America and India is as follows. The North American multi-millionaire maybe can send three kids to college without knowing it. The Indian multi-millionaire can own three colleges without knowing it. <laughs> now, here we had in 2008, 35,000 ex 30, excess capacity seats in one state for engineering mainly. So the government steps in and says in the name of the poor, that it is making free education for, edu for engineering from the weaker sections and pays the fees. So actually, the legislature passes a bill to pay fees to the legislators. Okay, <laughs> so that, that's the direction that universities are going in. So that pr the privatization, then the, the privatization of that has led to an unbelievable uh, pay and get your degree system. To get into medical college today, you are paying something like 2.5 to 3.5 million rupees. It's called capitation fees to get admission into that college. So the privatization process has been anarchistic, horrible, extremely anti-student and anti-community. Because the colleges that then come up have no obligation at all towards the community. And that's exactly what you know what she was talking about? Well, how universities that were once so close to the community, in the, in the public sector too, the whittling of funds under neoliberalism, the reduction of funds to the universities, except to prime central universities, that has put such a cash crunch on many lead institutions like the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, on many scientific research institutions, that they have turned to huge sums of money from corporations whose aims are those of corporations. They are not there to educate the public. So, you, the, how the, again and again it comes back to so what are your terms of engagement? What are the ethics of that engagement? Is this money going to do something good for us or not? Is it going to benefit the education process and the community? Those questions we need to answer. But the trend, as I said, the dominant trend is that these agricultural universities that I spoke about, they're not doing research for the farmer anymore. But they're doing all kinds of packaging for corporations. 
were not doing field research. The entire extension officer system in Indian agriculture has collapsed. The Prime Minister goes on record to say the extension system doesn't exist anymore. So the, once upon a time, the universities trained the extension officers for agriculture. Now, so that's the direction that neoliberalism is taking. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, the panel. Uh, I just wanted to say that in very different ways, and I think all the academics in the room will agree, um, that I think that North American Academy is also being corporatized very rapidly. I've spent 25 years of my life in the universe, the, the state university system. I'm a great admirer of it. I think it's one of the one of the great resources of the US. And I think it is very rapidly being ex, you know, followed out by corporatization. I think there's lots of studies to show it. I think the Monsanto question and corporate funding is very much linked to it. I don't think it's quite the way in which you're describing it here because political and social processes are different here. But I think I think the same process by which Universities are turning away from communities and responsibility to the immediate society in which they live is, is discernible here. I, I work with four different universities to pay a student, I work with four different universities, and I've seen it happen. From governance principles within the university being more and more top down, I think it goes all the way through, and I think we really do need to track that. I think the thing which we, I would like to insist on as a member of the university and the community is that the university universities be understood as a public good. Because it always comes down to money, right? I mean, that's the end of the story, right? But how you fund a public good is different from how you fund something else. We do not ask the question about whether drinking water is something which is necessary for the community or not. We recognize it as a public good, right? In the same way, and I think we were having this conversation about agriculture yesterday, that agriculture is really only sustainable when communities recognize that it's a public good. And in the same way, I think universities should be recognized as a public good. And that's a battle that every member of the university, from president, from board, from chancellor, to members of the faculty, have to be ready to fight and make in public that it's a public good. And along with the clear you know, terms of ethical engagement, but it's also a public good. The other thing which I do want to say on the question of Monsanto and how good or bad it is for agriculture and whether it helps to feed people or not, I, we do have a man who's been described here, Matthias Sen the Nobel Prize winning economist as one of the foremost experts on agriculture. So I don't know what, you know, China wants to say something about that. But for me, the education is a public good. I think that as a given, maybe I should have articulated that. But it's absolutely a public good. And yes, the way you fund a public good will be different from that. And precisely because it is public, all the more you need those terms of engagement, clear, transparent, open, open to question by the public. That the public interest is at all times discernible and negotiable, I mean, visible. Um, I, I really like what um, you said, Dr. Sarna, about um, the values have to be what um, guides us in our research and what we do. Um, you know, so in the beginning, I I said what our vision is, we are in our world was and what our mission was. And, um, you know, my colleagues and I, we, we spent a whole day just really hammering that out and looking at the values that we would be guided by. And one of the things that was discussed was, you know, as professors, they, they would look to us for our expertise. And there will be some people with their own kind of agenda on um, how they want to utilize our expertise. And we needed to be careful about what projects we would take on. So um, one of the things we did was we looked at what our values are. And um, we came up with this um, sort of acronym LACO, which uh, means uh, plentiful, prosperous, um, well supplied. And for each letter, we, we looked at what those values were. It was Laulima, which is working together. Alohaina, the reciprocal relationship between the people and the land. That, you know, Aina is not um, Aina unless there's people with that. And that we're working harmoniously with 
each other, understanding that we're an integral part of each other, not separate. Kuliana in the sense of not just rights but responsibilities, that those things needed to be in balance. And Ohana, you know, just like what Uncle Walter was saying, it's not just collaboration, it's really looking at this family, this university, who we work with, and that it is for abundant land and thriving people. So one of the things, um, you know, when we were looking at these values, I, I just like to read some parts. Um, Aloha Aina, Hui Aina Momona seeks to build Aloha Aina within Hawaii communities, the ability to care for natural and cultural resources, and to feed themselves in a sustainable way. Our work should enhance connections between people and the places they care for, come from, and work remaining grounded in hands-on relationships with place. Kuleana, Kui Aina Momona seeks to build Kuleana, a balance of rights and responsibilities towards resources in, re in which rights depend upon pono, fulfillment of responsibilities. We exercise our Kuleana by engaging in research with practical impacts for Hawaii's communities with which we have already established reciprocal relationships. You know, and one of the things when we were hired, Dean Maynette Benham said, we chose you because you are part of community, and we need community to be within these institutions. And we need you to go for it and be in your communities, work in your communities, so that we can learn from community as well as exchange knowledge with community. So I think that's what is the essence of what we need to be doing as a university. advocates for uh, what generates, uh, how you get tenure and promoted in the same old Western way, uh, what gets granted, what gets funded. Uh, one of the things I think Bill Isla said, and, and our uh, young man from India, uh, the idea that you have to understand the history of where you're at. Um, unfortunately, because I'm so old now, I understand a lot of the history of this place called University of Hawaii Manoa. It sits on ceded lands. We've had this discussion for decades about the history of where this sits and what does that mean as far as Kuleana and what kind of engagement with the native peoples. This has been going on for decades. The fact that we're beginning to have some movement with uh, the latest cluster hires and the Hawaii Nui Akea uh, School of Hawaiian Knowledge, that's, that's a positive movement forward. At the same time, simultaneously, we've taken steps far back. Um, when um, uh, Stanley Aronowitz's book came out decades ago about um, uh, basically corporatizing uh, the university and how the money's come in, both for corporations, through the military, right, through pharmaceuticals. You know, some of us in Hawaii were like, oh, that's plenty far away, not going to happen over here. But what has happened over here, when you sit in a Manoa faculty senate and senate executive committee for years, you find out that's exactly what's happened. We're no different than any other school and university around the globe. It really is money talks, and Kuleana has been walked out. So the question then becomes, what today, welcome Chancellor Apple into his second full year here um, in Hawaii, and the history of Mauna Kea, and the history of the UR on our campus that was recently reauthorized. There's a big fight over it. Because that's military money coming in, being told to our researchers, to our instructional faculty, to ex uh, extension agents on every item, that if they get given a task, there's no question. And that that research is then privatized and not used for the public good. So the whole point about being a public institution, land, sea, space, grant, we've been talking the talk for decades. But when it comes down to what is real and what is our commitment and engagement to the community, it hasn't been to engage the community 
in a trusting relationship as Bill Iron talked about DLNR. It really has been about the money. And all the BS talk about, oh yeah, 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 we'll show you crumbs, when the truth is the money has dictated the direction we go. And we have privatized, okay? The public good, we're a public university, we have privatized the goods. And we continue in that direction. So I agree with you, there's two directions. But the university is caught in a constant struggle, right? And with the federal government going down, with the potential defunding of the Native Hawaiian um, Education, Health, and, and uh, Housing Acts, we're talking about needing more money at a public institution where the state's not funding, but at the same time taking money that means we can privatize the university. I bring this up on a history, okay, that brings us to today, because I agree with you. So, as people said, you're a doer. Help us to help convince the university, and since the chancellor's here, to put forth, whether it's a task force, you know, kids at that have all the task force, but some entity that begins to actually articulate and draft and implement, okay, a policy on the ethical mm -hmm. framework she's talking about. Because when I sat up the Monroe Faculty Senate, and the Senate Executive Committee, and we talked about proprietary research, and we tried to have an ethical standard. It became an absolute farce, okay, an absolute farce. And so if you read our one sentence about it, it says nothing, okay? So it's a free-for-all for researchers at this university to do whatever they like on proprietary interests, okay, moving forward. So I, I'll volunteer since I'm in the advocacy office. And I believe there should be advocates in their positions, especially tenured faculty. And I believe that the uh, recent hires should be accredited in a tenure process, the work that they do in the community, because right now I worry that they're not. So I like volunteer to be on a committee that the chancellor sets forth today, okay? That we look at the ethical framework you're talking about in our public university, that we actually look at the tenure promotion, um, contract renewal process, that these young uh, scholars are being hired, but get credited for the community engagement, because there's real concern that they're not gonna in the current structure. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Sound raw raw will be a good recruitment, but the retention and the sustainability and the succession is a real concern. So I like volunteer. And anybody else, I know me and Misa, and uh, maybe Cindy and some other seasoned veterans on campus, but Chancellor, I, I would like to volunteer <laughs> to make that happen. You know, trying to say so we could be part of that university movement in the right direction. What is formal and what is honest to this land, to these people, to the culture, to the history? That's what I'm talking about. And have I community like reps oh. on the task. Community. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I like that. Please feel to be inarticulate, but not disingenuous. What I should have said is that uh, in Sea Grant, one of our core values is uh, non advocacy. And one of our core values is to bring the best possible information to the table, be able to communicate with both sides or all sides of an issue so that they can bring the best possible information to their discussion. So uh, I apologize for uh, certainly many things and it's appropriate for university faculty to be advocates. It's just not part of our DNA. Any more questions? Um, I just was wondering if, you know, that task force or similar, if there was a role for one of the deans who helped to create these positions brought something up to me that I've really been thinking about ever since, which is, um, and it's about research ethics and community engagement. And you might have, um, Professor Sinan, you might have um, suggestions for us. You talked about all of these terms of engagement of good models and things to look into. Um, but one of the things he said is social scientists, we have an IRB for research with people, right? Anytime you want to go out and talk to people, um, you have to do this IRB review process to make sure it's ethical, you don't hurt people, the information share is honest, things like that. But there's no IRB process for, for land, for place. So this was something that was a concern to me as a community member of working at Waipa was many researchers would come and work with us, but we didn't always know 
you know, enough about their research, how to engage with them. We didn't always get the findings after, so we started to draft some um, guidelines for ethical research in our place, both for things we as a community had to do to bring them in, and things that they had to do. So simple things like everyone had to learn an oli. That's how I first met Gordon, was teaching him an oli when he came to Waipa. They needed to learn a traditional chant to enter the place. Um, they had to come and do a work day in the community first before they got approval for their project. Um, we as a community had to see that as much dollars were spent on our lands on research, an equal amount should be spent on restoration or actual hands-on changes in the land. So, you know, things like that. We dropped up a whole bunch of things, but that was something that um, had been brought to our attention at Kui Aino Momona, something we might be able to contribute to as well, um, and that maybe there's a need for in the university is, is sort of an IRD process, because as Kalani Evanson said, every place has a history and a people attached to it. And those things are not often accounted for in the research approval process. Anybody else? Quite, nobody's asking these questions. Yeah, what about an IRB for when the fund comes? In other words, an ethical policy for evaluating not only the people and their research, but the funding. Um, parenthetical point for Chancellor Apple since you mentioned it. Um, yes, Monsanto does make the pretense that they want to feed the world, but I believe their claims are disingenuous and hyperbolic. And I know you're a very busy man, but I think there's research out there that would indicate that in fact the yields are lower when they're um, producing their genetically modified crops. Um, question for Brandon from Kamehameha Schools. Always admire your courage to uh, appear on a panel like this. And uh, it occurred to me that you mentioned the value of seeds and how they can sprout into wonderful things. Many of us here believe that when they are being monopolized and manipulated by a company like Monsanto, they don't sprout into wonderful things. And when our representative from Sea Grant says that land development and land use policies are what has such a severe impact on coastal areas, it leads me to my question for you. When we look at your association with Monsanto, when we look at some of the development plans that you have in Kakaako and the North Shore, why should we not be concerned about how those will have an impact on the integrity and sustainability of our land and our coastal areas? Mahalo for the question. You know, for me, I have to speak, um, I have to be honest that I'm not in a position to speak really authentically or well on the issue of the Monsanto with coming in school. There are people in my organization that can, and I can refer you to them. Um, what I know in terms of, of the work that we do, and I guess maybe it's the fact that the same thing happening at the university, right? You're big enough that you have different parts spinning, sometimes spinning in different directions. Um, so what I can speak to is the amount of investment that I've personally seen. You know, I've been at KS for now seven years. And I've seen tremendous transformations in the way that we embrace or encounter or think about Aina. Not as, as you said, divorced from people at all. And, and something that's a deeper value. Um, what I hope that we can produce through the educational outreach that we're doing, that's very Aina based, is to get our students, our families, our communities to a point of engagement and education to take a stand on those issues. Um, and I think even to tease it apart too, to say, you know, GMO, I, I need to break that down. We're talking about any kind of modification at all that, that can happen to a plant, which, or are we talking about specific privatization, um, you know, monopoly around, you know, a, a certain process that doesn't get shared out. 
So first, that's a big one for me, but I, I want to participate in the process of growing learners to a point where they're, they're deeply impassioned about those issues, can engage with them. Um, and I know that from our portfolio, again, I can't speak to it directly, but, but that's probably 1% of, of, of what coming in schools is doing. I think it's through a sub sub-lease. I, I don't even know the specifics, but I can tell you that I've seen, you know, in the past you know, four years, about two and a half million dollars be given out to community collaborators to be able to do that kind of work that hopefully will put us in a position where we do have that, the voices around us to make those statements to us that we, and we hear them today. We're, we're not, not listening to them. Um, so I apologize for not being able to answer that question directly to where we're at, but my belief that where I'm putting my seeds of hope are in the generation of folks that we're touching today that will then be able to provide the guidance and community data to get us going forward. I'm sorry, I have to wrap up the signal. Thank you. Um, well, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, thank you for the panelists, and thank you, Chancellor Apple, for being here. I know you've given up a fair amount of time, and also for the funding to make this possible. We really appreciate your presence to Dean Denon for hosting us, and for all of you, and for a great discussion. I think these are vital questions. I think everybody will agree with regard to what a university is and what it does, and we may defer, but we all care about the university, and I think we should really engage these questions. So thank you everybody, thank you to Cindy and Walter, my co-organizers, and once again a round of applause for the panel. Okay, that was it. We are at uh, Kamakaku Okalani uh, Center for Hawaiian Studies. Thanks for joining us. Walt Ritty, Okay, Aloha, live. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a very uh, hot Q&A session. So I think that actually might be a highlight point of uh, our presentation today is the Q&A session. Well,